For those of you that were here this past Wednesday night as we were finishing up the study that we've been on for the last four weeks, um, you'll remember that I made the statement that this first scripture that we're looking at, when I think of Peter, this is my favorite one uh, when I think of him because um, it was the beginning of Peter's mind just being blown by Jesus Christ and the person of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, the power of Jesus. And what I hope to show you this morning between the scriptures that I'm going to share with you is that there was a transition in Peter's life between who he is in this first scripture that we're going to read this morning and who he was in this last scripture that we're going to read. Now, I also say this, came into Sunday school this morning, had a substitute teacher who deviated from the regular Sunday school plan, and he spoke about Peter too. And he even talked about how Peter, after he had experienced everything I'm about to tell you, still had his own faults, still had his own failures, and still had to be corrected in love by another one of God's people so that there would be unity in the church. So what does that tell us about us as human beings? We go through hilltops and we go through valleys, don't we? There are some times when we can't get enough of Jesus because we see how good he really is and there are times in our life where Jesus is the last person that we want anything to do with. Even though we belong to his family. Isn't that something? I mean, that's a harsh reality, isn't it? You know, I even heard a Christian one time when we were talking about Bible study. They said, I don't do Bible study. I know all about him that I want to know. It kind of tells you what some of our attitudes are sometimes, doesn't it? And yet we see that he loves us as they sung that last song anyway, even in our ignorance. Because you know where I find myself when I say, I got enough of him, I don't need any more of him, flat on my back. With the only place to look is up. And for me to say, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Will you forgive me? And I'm so thankful that he is my daddy. He's my Abba Father. And I love him, and I hope that you all do too this morning. Here in Luke chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 11, I, I like to read and we welcome everyone that's watching from home this morning, and we're thankful that you all are here. We're thankful for our visitors that we have with us this morning. We're thankful that we just have an opportunity to share Jesus and what Jesus does to us so that we can examine ourselves. You know, as I was writing these notes down, I was thinking about one of the things that I hear the most by people that have left this church and left other churches. You know what they say? I'm leaving because I feel like I'm not getting fed. You ever heard somebody say that before? But guess what? The shepherd's job isn't really to feed the sheep. The shepherd's job is to put you in the pasture so that you can eat for yourself. Because have you ever seen a shepherd spoon feeding a sheep out in the pasture? No. The sheep have got to go out in that pasture because the shepherd puts you in one where the grass has grown a little bit higher, a little bit greener. Puts you in just the right place where you can get something and you can grow because of it. But that sheep, Dan, has got to put his head down to the grass, has got to pull it up off the ground and has got to chew it and eat it before they can grow and get stronger. So ultimately... It is each and every one of your jobs as a child of God to feed yourself. And the, the way we should come into the Lord's house is with thanksgiving from what he has already fed us as we've read the word 
And then everything else, Rick, that happens is just extra around the plate. So this morning as we think about Peter, I want you to think about the things that I'm going to share with you this morning because this is his initial response to what Jesus is asking him to do. I want to ask you, first of all, to, to consider this. One, have you made this initial response? That's what Mark was just talking about. Today could be your day. To make the initial response of when the Holy Spirit pricks your heart, says, I want you, and draws you near to God, that you would say, yes, today is the day. I'm not going to wait any longer. I'm going to bow my knee and give my life to Jesus Christ today. He is going to be the Lord of my life. But we also see in this scripture this morning that he is at the beginning of a relationship with Jesus. And Jesus is going to ask a lot of him at the beginning of this relationship. In, in fact, Jesus is going to ask something out of him that many of us have still, after years of being a Christian, have not given to the Lord. He's going to ask him to forsake all. What does that mean to you this morning? When he says forsake all. Because I'm going to tell you. Our church today is in turmoil. And I'm talking about the church across the United States of America. Why are we in turmoil? Well. This thing called COVID-19 has exposed a lot of problems with our churches. It has brought many harsh realities to the people in the church. And many of the people that have been serving in the church, it has brought clarity to their own Christian minds. And it's also shown a lot of places where we were going through the motions, Morgan, and where God is saying that's not good enough anymore. I'm going to show you a new way. I'm going to do a new thing. But will you forsake all and allow me to do that? So as we read these scriptures this morning, think about that. Have you forsaken all? I mean, after all, he forsook all God forsook all to send Christ to be our Savior. And now, do we just serve out of the convenience of our time? Do we just serve out of the convenience of our home? Do we, cons do we serve out of the convenience of um, our schedule? Or what we think that we can or cannot do? Or have we truly forsaken all so that we can do whatever the Lord would ask of us? And whatever that might be. Here it says, so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Generoset and saw two boats standing by the lake. Now, how many of y'all already know that God knew one of those boats was going to be Simon Peter's boats? He did. He already had a plan. And it says, but the fishermen had gone from them and washing their nets. How many of y'all in here like to fish? All right, let me ask you this. At the end of fishing, let's say, for instance, we leave here today. We ride over to Topsail. We're on Johnny Mercer's Pier. We fish for eight hours, and we walk off with absolutely nothing but a wind and sunburn. We put our fishing poles in the truck or the car and all of our gear, and all of a sudden, someone walks up to us and says, Pull out your rods and your gear and go back out and fish. That's the reality of what Jesus is doing here in the presence of Simon Peter. It says they were washing their nets, which means that they had finished fishing. And then he got into one of the boats, Jesus did, which was Simon's boat. You see, James and John, they already knew who Jesus was. In fact, they had been telling Simon about who Jesus was because they had 
already knew who John the Baptist was and what his ministry was. But Simon was that guy that was just a little bit harder to reach. Do y'all know somebody in your life that they know of Jesus, but they don't actually know Jesus? They hang out with people that love Jesus, but they actually don't belong to Jesus. That was Simon at this point in his life. And it says that Jesus got into a boat, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Well, this served many purposes because one, Aiden, it is hard to project your voice to a crowd of people when a crowd of people have swarmed around you. You get very small very quickly. But when you can get in a boat and get pushed out, say, 10 feet, 15 feet out in the water, us human beings that are dry have a tendency to not want to get wet. So Jesus is in Peter's boat and he slips off into the water just a little bit. And it says he taught the multitudes. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Well, that's what I was just sharing with you. And I want to ask you this. When's the last time you launched out into the deep? When's the last time that the Holy Spirit of God prompted you to say something or do something and he said, launch out into the deep. It's going to be uncomfortable for you. You may not know how to do it. You might not have the time to do it. But I want you now to launch out into the deep of your life. Well, he asked Peter to do this. And he said, let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master. We have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners, hey, come on over here. We got so many fish, we can't even bring them in. And it says, and they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. Y'all know that's a lot of fish, isn't it? Enough boats that the boats start to sink. And it says, and when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken and so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. The things I want you to see out of these scriptures is there in verse 4, I've already challenged you that sometimes God asks you to launch out. That takes action, doesn't it? And those of us who find ourselves going through the motions find that going a different avenue than the motion that feels comfortable is hard to do sometimes, isn't it? We call it muscle memory. You take somebody that works in a textile mill and they do the same thing over and over and over and over and over throughout their eight hour day. If you ask them to go in a different motion one time or two times from what is normal, they would have an issue with that. In fact, what it would do is not only mess that person up, but it would mess up the whole line. Of what everybody's doing. Because the timing would be off. And we are a people that love timing, don't we? It's got to be in our time. Jesus has got to be on our schedule. We got to work him around our kids. We got to work him around schoolwork. We got to work him around our job. We got to work him around our nap. 
or how long we sleep, we got to work Jesus around. But he is telling Peter here or Simon, I don't care what you have done all night, launch out. Jesus is saying to you, consider me, try me, just, just try me, try doing what I'm asking you to do. Well, it's a great time for me to mention that our Christian service surveys haven't all been turned in yet. And I've already shared with you all that if they don't get turned in, you either get phone calls that we're going to ask you to serve and possibly in a way that you're you may not feel led to serve, which we don't want that to be the case. But the opposite of that is we have to cut ministries that we do here if we don't have people that's been led by God's spirit to check these things off and serve in those ways. So Jesus is saying, try me. He is saying, consider me when I ask you to do something. And then we see in verse 8 what Peter's response is. Perhaps the reason why we don't do the things that Jesus asked us to do is because we're more in line with depart from me for I am sinful. Because sin separates, doesn't it? Sin separates us, and it's not that we're not forgiven from the sin, but what we do is we don't forgive ourselves of it. And our enemy uses it to amplify what we can't do for the Lord instead of us using our faith to realize what we can do for the Lord. So Peter's response there was, depart from me, for I am sinful. It's a struggle that we go through. And then verse 11 Jesus, after all of that, says to him, forsake all and follow. Which tells us this. Obedience bears spiritual fruit. So if you were a fruit tree today, and I was walking through the orchard, would you be a good tree or would you be a bad tree? Would you be a tree that says, I give olives, but when I look on you, you're either bare or you're got, you've got lemons? Would you say I'm an apple tree and you actually are an apple tree? Or in your mind, have you said that you are something so many times out of the Christian experience that you have started to be, believe that you're that? When you're really not. Jesus is saying. Obedience bears fruit. Forsake all and follow me. Well. I want you to understand. As I said earlier. Our church is in a place. Where we're learning. And. It isn't just here at Friendly. It's everywhere. You know what one of the things we do as church people that is wrong? We pretend that everything's right. Ultimately, probably the best thing we could do this morning is all be on our knees at the altar weeping because of what we've experienced over the last 57 weeks. And because of the tens and thousands of people who have died in our nation. You see, we've all been dehumanized. And we hear the numbers, but we don't see the faces that go with it. We hear the numbers, but we don't see the sadness of the families who have lost. And our position as a church is to feel what others feel in scripture it says be happy when people are happy be sad when people are sad and that it is much greater sometime to mourn than to rejoice
And we take our feeling of, I want to come to church, but I've got to act like everything's okay with me and I've got to tell everybody that I'm okay. And we come into God's house and we feel empty because we can't feel and we can't be who we are. And we can't minister to one another unless we're real with one another. So as we all come into our church houses trying to do what we used to do instead of doing what God might call us to do now, sometimes we feel sad. And we can't understand why we don't have joy. And sometimes we feel empty even though the word of God tells us that with Jesus Christ we're full. So obedience bears fruit, but first we have to forsake all. We have to forsake the facades that we put up for other people to think we're something that we're not sometimes. And bef until we do those kinds of things and we are broken before Jesus, I as a pastor understand that it's a vicious cycle that we're on. So you and everyone that attends church, regardless of whether it's here, whether it's Mount Holly, whether it's Burgall Baptist, whether it's Gateway Community, any church that's in our community, we all kind of feel the same way. Broken. Empty. Confused. We miss what was and we wonder what should be. Well, as we look at the apostle or Peter here, we see that Jesus unloads a lot on him. He's excited because he's caught fish. He's a businessman. He gets all these fish in and then Jesus says, follow me, forsake all. Do what I'm asking you to do. And here in a minute, I'll share with you why that's so important. Turn with me over to John chapter 21. Do you all identify with what I'm saying this morning? Just nod your head if you are. We're kind of like that assembly line, Robert. Robert. We only know how to worship in certain ways, but maybe Jesus is wanting us to do a new thing. It, it's nothing wrong with it. We just don't know what the new thing is. We don't know what the boundaries of the new thing is, and we don't know the timing of the new thing. So in John 21, 1 through 12, it says, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. <clears throat> and in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, which was James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, and you know what he did? He launched himself into the water. He plunged, it says, into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. 
Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, fish laid on it and bread. And look what Jesus says, come and dine. Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. And Simon Peter was so excited, he went up and he dragged the net to land full of large fish. It says 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. And Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. I want you to see in verse 3 this morning that this is the first time in three years that the Bible records that Peter went fishing. Because what we read in Luke chapter 5 was the end of Peter's fishing career. Because it tells us that he got off the boat that day and Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. But you know what? A lot had happened between Luke chapter 5 and John chapter 21. When he says, I am going fishing, let me explain to you where his heart's at. And I say this because of this. This first scripture I apply to Peter is where we have been. As a church. <clears throat> Jesus gave a command. We did what he asked us to do. We walked in that for quite some time. Yet things have happened. It's not that Jesus has left us. It's not that he's gone anywhere. But now we must react to who we are in him. Perhaps in a different way. And that's what we see in this second scripture. You see, in the first one, Jesus had to tell them to launch out. But in this second scripture, because Peter had a history with Jesus, that when John says, it is the Lord, Peter could not launch out quick enough. But it was launching himself into the water to get to the Lord. Why did he do that? Because in between those scriptures, three years had passed. Jesus had said, come on out on the water. And he walked on it. Jesus had sat with him at the table and said, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. Peter had been in the garden. He had drawn him sword. And he had cut Malchus's ear off. Peter had been with Jesus whenever he healed those that had been healed. He had been there when he took a few loaves and a few fishes. And he fed great crowds of people. He had experienced the fullness of God just as many of us have. We have prayed. We have cried out to God. We have sung with our voices lifted high. We have done community projects for the Lord. We've had Bible studies in which we've been led to do. We've had sermons that we've been led to do. We've served in VBS. We've served in the community and other kids' ministries. <coughs> but now time has gone by, just as with Peter. Peter. Something new is happening with Jesus because he's not even in a glorified body yet. He has died on the cross. Peter has scattered with the other disciples, standing outside the gate fearful, denying him that someone would know who he was. He is in inner turmoil and a mess. Does anybody understand what inner turmoil and a mess feels like? Have you been there recently? Well, notice in verse 6 that just like in the very first time that he has interaction with Jesus, Jesus gives direction that produces a fresh catch. 
How many of you want a fresh catch in the Lord this morning? Because guess what? The Bible says you can't put new wine in old wineskins. It takes something fresh, something new, before you can put new wine in it. And here Jesus is producing this, and it's exciting that yet again, even though Peter has gone through all of these hard times in his life, that Jesus yet again not only has come back from the dead, but yes, he is with me again. He has given us another chance. He is talking to us and asking us to do his command. Do you long for his command in your life this morning? Do you long to hear his voice? Are you like Abraham? That you want to know where the Lord would have you to go? Are you like Moses that you want to see the Lord so badly in your life that the Lord makes a pact with you that he will let you see him through the cleft of the rock as he passes by? Do we have a desire to see the Lord in your individual lives? <laughs> when verse 7, when John acknowledges that it's the Lord who has done this, Peter launches off the boat and drags 153 large fish in in a net. But as I said, a lot has happened between these two occurrences. You know what the biggest thing that has happened is? Peter has had a heart change. The first time Jesus did this, it was to change Peter's heart from an unbeliever to a believer. The second time he does this, he is putting him together to be Cephas, the rock in which the church would be built upon. Jesus knows that the Holy Spirit is coming that we read about in the book of Acts. And he knows that Peter is going to preach a sermon that's going to bring 3,000 people to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Even though Peter doesn't know that already, the Lord is lining up the life, the unencumbered life of a person who can forsake all and follow him. Well, another thing that happened during this period of time is what we want to observe this morning. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Jesus sits in the upper room with his disciples. Jesus tells the disciples, including Peter, did you ever notice that in Scripture, when it's talking about the disciples, usually it says the disciples and Peter. It just says the disciples, but then he's so important to the Lord that he calls him by name. So he's in this upper room with Jesus and Jesus says this one of you will betray me and Peter is sitting beside of John the one who Jesus loved let's give him credit as he gives himself and Peter says to John ask him who is going to betray him And Jesus tells them that it would be the one who puts his hand to the bread as he puts his hand to the bread to eat. We all know that to be the person of Judas. But what he is also experiencing here as Jesus is preparing them for his going away to be beside of God at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us. He is telling them about the new covenant. That when he does die on the cross, that the bread would represent his body and that the blood would represent the blood that had been shed, not only for them, but also for us. If you will, let's open up the cup at this time.
<clears throat> and it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed and he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. You see, Peter didn't understand it at the time. But he would later on, wouldn't he? And then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they all drank it, and he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. And that many includes us today. As Peter experienced this in the upper room, he was somewhat the leader of the apostles. This is at the time where he tells Jesus, I won't let anything happen to you. Yet Jesus predicts his denial. Even though we've seen in these scriptures how the Lord is guiding Peter, and we are often like that, let me ask you this today. How many of you can let go of tradition and grab hold of the new thing that Jesus is wanting to do? For quite some time now, we've had this feeling inside of us that we couldn't put words to it. But we just realized that what Jesus is doing is a little different than what he has done in the past. People are not responding to the past. So what is our job now as a church? What is your position now as a Christian? Well... First of all, you need to understand that you got to die to yourself. Because if you are a Christian, if you are truly a born-again believer of God, your identity is in the death of Jesus Christ. This reminder of what we just had with his body and his blood is telling us that. But also we have to understand that we have to wait until he says, cast out and drop your net. You can't rush Jesus. If you do, what you do will be unfruitful. They could have went, Bruce, out in that boat 50 times. And drop their net on the left and on the right in the very same place. And call absolutely nothing. But when Jesus speaks to our hearts. And he says, now is the time to drop the net. And this is the side to drop the net on. Will you listen to him? Will I listen to him? Will we be obedient so that we can bear fruit? You see, we've gotten lulled into this idea that church can only happen with pews, with screens and projectors and speakers and air conditioning, hymnals, one to 50 Bibles in our hand, whichever one we want to carry in that day. But what will Jesus ask us to do? What if he asks us to do a new thing? What if he asks us to do something that we did a long time ago that was unfruitful, yet he says, now is the time? It doesn't matter that you're mending your nets. If you want to catch fish, get back in the boat and launch out. So today, as we end this service, with no music playing, I simply ask you all to stand with me. Hmm. 
God's people. I've said this a lot here lately. We all have the knowledge to start a church. Now do we have the enthusiasm to do the things that the Lord would ask us to do. As a body and as an individual. And when he does ask, will we say yes? Today is a day that maybe he is already touching your heart and saying, that's what you need to do. But for others, it's a preparatory day. So that you might consider the timing of God. And what he might ask you to do in the near future. And it might seem odd. It might seem totally different than anything you've ever done. I mean, we got, we've got three people that I'm going to meet with on Wednesday for children's church teachers that, as far as I know, they've never taught children's church before. But you know what I see? Jesus doing a new thing. And will this children's church be like the last children's church we had? No. But guess what? It doesn't have to be. Because what's our number one objective to having children's church? It's to tell our children about Jesus Christ in hopes that the Holy Spirit would prick their heart so that they would bow their knee before an almighty God and surrender their life to him. So that they may make many disciples and so that they would not spend eternity in hell. God asks us to do new things. It's exciting when he does that, but it's also scary. You know why? Because it's going to mess up the assembly line. It's going to mess up the timing of things. It's going to make us all uncomfortable. But if he's asking us to do it, who are we to say no? You see all that Peter would have missed if he would have just rested in any of his own thoughts, whether it be at the beginning or whether it be after he was a disappointment. He would have never preached that sermon that led 3,000 people to Christ. He would have never seen those cloven tongues of fire come down upon him and speak in a language that the Holy Spirit of God could give him. Something that he could not even give himself. Yet because of his obedience, he did so. So this morning, I'm just going to call you to prayer. That when the Lord calls, that you will be obedient. The altar is open. If it's hard for you to get down at the altar, we've got three front pews that are available. I ask the church today to come and pray. So if you will, please come and pray.